Everybody, this is We're Live, pal. I'm Andrew Zarian, of course, with me. This is our first uh, first show. Uh, we've done a couple trials here. We've gotten things going. This is our first show, first version of We're Live, pal. Of course, with me, Denise Salcedo. Hey, I'm so happy to be on here. We're officially, we're live, pal. This is it, and this is our first show. Excited that we're going to be having the show every single Tuesday live at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. 3 p.m. Eastern time. I'm ready. You're ready. I know you're ready. Uh, <laughs> listen, I'm super ready, too, because we've been working on this thing for months now. We've been trying to orchestrate and put it together. But we came up with a great name. Uh, we had a couple other options. I, I'll let Garrett talk about what the options were with the other <laughs> names. I know he's using one of them. Uh, Garrett Gonzalez here with me. What's going on, Garrett? What's up? What's up? Yeah, so we, we, had, uh, we, had, we had a name that we were kind of thinking, this may be it. Observe this, brother. But we decided against it. We went with we're, we're live, pal. I did take it for for my own. I got Big Dave's approval to take that uh, name of a show. But yeah, we're live, pal. The old reference with uh, Jim Ross and and Sid Vicious on a live TV show. I like it because we're going to be live, and uh, hopefully we don't uh, screw up like Sid did on that program. Uh, I'm positive we're going to screw up, and uh, <laughs> and the person and the person here that's going to regret all of this, uh, Mr. Brian Alvarez. How you doing, Brian? Dude, we've already screwed up. <laughs> Where I, are just, I just spent a whole show promoting that we were live, pal. <laughs> and it turns out we're not live. No, we're doing a pre-recorded. Brian, where are you right now? Where, where, what, uh, what, what bunker are you are you in right now? I'm in, uh, I'm in Cannon Beach, Oregon, at this bunker right here. Very and, nice. And uh, I came down here, and I was all set up to do everything, and then I realized that I, I didn't have anything with which to connect to Skype. And so I am. Uh, I am on my iPhone right now, and that's that. I gotta tell you, it looks remarkable for people watching. It, looks, it actually it looks, looks way looks better great. than my normal show, so I may have to use my <laughs> iPhone more often. It, uh, that's how it always happens, right? The easiest uh, solution is the, sometimes the best one. Uh, we got a couple topics here we want to go through. Uh, I want to start off with Monday Night Raw yesterday. Uh, you know, I, I thought it was a different Raw. They had moments that were really good, and then they had some moments that were just uh abysmal uh garrett i'm gonna start off with you and, and and go right back to denise what was your opinion of the show because a couple things stood out that i really enjoyed and then it just went weird you know the thing that i liked the most is uh them trying to do something with kofi kingston uh they had they had woods there and they had woods in a hell in a cell match that so was kind of weird to do three different shows with hell in a cell matches uh but you know, if this sort of leads to Kofi at Money in the Bank, and you could even lead further into Big E being a part of this, like maybe let, let's say, you know, Big E wins a match where he, he's got to come in uh, from the SmackDown side. Like, I, I like the idea of using the New Day like this. I like the idea of going back to Kofi winning the title in, uh, in New York. Uh, was it New York? I think it was New York. Uh, and, and just, you know, establishing you know, the New Day as as top acts. Because I, I feel like they are more fan favorites than they've actually been a top act uh, it, for from time to time. But I, I, I do hope that something comes out of this because I like the Lashley character, MVP, and his back and forth with Kofi has been awesome over the last few weeks. And so there, I think, is a, is a, real, is a really good uh, program to start. Now, whether or not it, it goes to fruition and, and, and it's actually good, that's to be, uh, to be determined. But I, I liked that. And, uh, and look, you know, got to see Matt Riddle and Drew McIntyre have a really fun match. Matt Riddle and Randy Orton are probably my favorite act in wrestling right now. I get so much joy and, uh, you know, entertainment out of the two of them just goofing off together, Randy being the straight, the, the, the straight man there. But yeah, I, I thought, you know, for a show that is often more head scratching than it was entertaining, I thought yesterday was a, you know, a, a pretty good foot in the right direction. Denise, See, I was, uh, I was checking out your live tweets. So you were, you were, you were doing the whole thing. What, where did, what did you think of the show? So I always live tweet during the show because you just never know what's going to happen on Monday Night Raw. And that's not necessarily a great thing. But here's the thing is that every sort of week I feel like I'm watching the show and I'm thinking, oh, my God, what are they doing? What is happening here? But this week, I got to say, even though I was not necessarily a fan of everything that went down on the actual show, 
I gotta say, I felt like they actually put some sort of effort in last night's Monday Night Raw because look, we got the five qualified Money in the Bank matches. And with that alone, already we have purpose. I mean, one of the biggest things that we're always talking about is how we have so many re rematches over and over again, and they mean nothing. At least this time we have them for a purpose. And now we talk about, you know, Dewdrop and Piper Niven and all of that with Eva Marie. I'm not a fan of that. At least it gave me something to talk about so i know it's kind of a low bar but at least we have that and then with nikki cross coming out with this new character this new superhero thing i gotta say that that got several mixed reactions i started feeling like i was not going to be a fan of it and then by the end of the night i was like well this isn't that terrible so i think that at least there was an effort put you know obviously the hell in a cell main event drew mcintyre matt riddle as garrett just mentioned so i at least felt there was a lot to take from that Monday Night Raw. Brian, do drop. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll talk about do drop in a second. So I, <laughs> I, uh, I watched that show and I just thought I don't trust anything these people do because I watch on delay. And so I get all of these emails and stuff from people and, and tweets and texts as the show is going on. So I know everything that's happening on the show before I even watch it. And everyone keeps mentioning, oh, what a night of upsets. You know, I hear Ricochet actually got a win. And then, you know, uh, Matt Riddle beat Drew McIntyre. And Randy Orton lost to John Morrison. I'm like, man, what's going on here? They're putting all these these guys over, which they never do. And then I watch the show. And, of course, you know, there's, there's distraction, interference, distraction, interference. And then in the Drew McIntyre match, Drew actually puts the guy over clean. So then I start thinking about it. And it's like, okay, so we got money in the bank. And they want a bunch of, of high flyers in there. They want your ricochets and they want your John Morrisons. And so, you know, what a way to, to do some upset wins on Raw to get them into a match that, like, most of them are going to lose. The stars that lost, it was all distraction finishes and everything like that, except Drew, who lost clean. And then he is in a three-way next week, which I figure he's going to win because he lost clean. And then I figure because he put someone over clean, they're probably going to give him the Money in the Bank briefcase. So there were a bunch of upsets on the show, but like when this show was over, did I think, oh, they're going to do something with Ricochet now. Oh man, they're going to do something with John Morrison. No, it's just like a gimmick to get some people into a Money in the Bank match under the guise of, oh, we're putting over some new faces. So I didn't trust anything that they did. I liked that they did it, I thought the matches were good. I thought the Riddle-Drew McIntyre match was awesome. I was happy to see the clean finishes, but I didn't see the clean finishes as being something where, oh, it's time to elevate some new people here. It was like they did something for one day to get people into a match where they could shine because we need eight people in that match. And a John Morrison is probably going to be better served being in that match or a Ricochet than the guys that they beat. And then the guys that they beat are going to end up in probably bigger matches on the show. So that was my takeaway from that. As yeah, far as we... Dewdrop, <laughs> the Dewdrop thing. So last week, Piper Niven debuts, and she doesn't have a name. And then I think it was Sean Ross Sapp that uh, had, had tweeted out or something that he had heard that she was going to be called Dewdrop. And so then, you know, the Observer comes out, and we find out that they trademarked Dewdrop. So they have the name. So I watched the show this week, and like they totally are are backtracking off this dewdrop thing. Like she's given the name and she doesn't like it, and then she walks out on Eva Marie, and Eva Marie gets pinned. We're a week in. <laughs> so all I could think was, is this a reaction to the fans not liking the name Dewdrop that you did all this? And if that's the case, my other thought is, well, why didn't you just not use the name? It was never mentioned on television. Nobody knew about it except like people on the internet or people that read The Observer or whatever. So if there's a backlash to using the name Dewdrop, why don't you just call her Piper Niven and do whatever he had planned instead of going with the name that you know everybody hates and then trying to find a way out of it? Well, also, they bumped it up a week, right? I, I, I think people, uh, uh, you had reported, and I, I think I, I posted it somewhere that it was supposed to happen last week. She was supposed to debut. The debut was supposed to happen. Was it last week? It happened or a week before. It was a week before Eva Marie debuted, right? She was yes, supposed to Eva debut Marie the week was after. 
Well, no. Eva Marie was supposed to debut last week. Last right? week. There you go. Yeah. It yeah. was one week ago. And then Piper Niven shows up and is her surrogate or whatever. They use some wacky. What was her? Uh, what was the word they Protégé. used last night? Protege? Uh, no, was, they used another name. Her proxy. Oh they they said it was her proxy. <laughs> I was like, that's weird. So she was her proxy last week. And then literally one week later, they're already breaking up the act. I was like, it's been a week. So the other thing, the other thing that was interesting was right before Raw went on the air, Bobby Lashley teased Bill Goldberg in his tweet. Yeah, I mean, and and, and I'm thinking, I'm like, you know, he put that out there. I don't think it's a coincidence. And then I don't know if you saw the USA Network piggybacked on it and kind of alluded at Bill Goldberg. So I, I I'm now curious if this is the the backup plan for Brock Lesnar because I know that they were working on Brock Lesnar for SummerSlam. Does this now lead into a Bill Goldberg match uh, with Bobby well, Lashley? Well, all I know is that uh, they obviously want to do a huge SummerSlam. And so it's going to be like a totally packed show. And so if you look at who the champions are, you look at, at Lashley, and it's like, okay, well, who's going to face Lashley? I mean, you could do Brock Lesnar, which is the obvious. And if Brock Lesnar's not available, then Goldberg would be another uh, good opponent. Kofi Kingston is clearly there as a placeholder because you got pay-per-views between now and SummerSlam. And I don't even know how well they thought out the Kofi Kingston thing because Kofi did beat him on TV, but he beat him as a result of Drew interfering. And then the next week on TV, they did Drew and Kofi for the number one contendership, and Kofi lost. So if you were going to do Kofi Kingston at the Money in the Bank show, I don't know why you bothered doing that match. So, you know, they have no deal with, with Brock Lesnar. And it could have been that... Vince figured I can get Brock, so we'll just shoot the angle, and then we'll talk to Brock. Brock's no dummy. I mean, he may be holding out for more money. And uh, if he does, Goldberg, I think, is a perfectly good replacement for Brock for a big SummerSlam match for Lashley. Because right now what they're doing with all their champions is it's big, unbeatable champions. Nobody on the normal roster is any match for these people. So we got to go outside. We got to get a John Cena. We got to eventually get The Rock if we can. We got to get Brock Lesnar. We got to get Bill Goldberg. I mean, to me, you should be building up people on the actual roster that can beat these people. That's not what they're doing right now. Not at all. So, uh, Money in the Bank, uh, Denise, what do you think? How, what do you think of this buildup for Money in the Bank right now? So that's what I want to add to what Brian just mentioned right now. So, you know, you look at some of the people that have already been named, you, you Matt Riddle, Ricochet, Morrison, and all of that. And while these are all guys that we know are going to be spectacular in the Money in the Bank match, the thing is, though, that while we you can say we're fans of these guys, they're not necessarily guys that you believe are credible enough to actually become champions. So here's the thing is that I would hope, but I don't think that this is actually going to happen, but I do hope that with whoever that they decide wins the money in the bank let's just say i don't know ricochet or something okay let's say they decide ricochet the problem is that no one actually believes that he is going to become champion so by then the only thing that i feel that they can do is actually do something with whoever they really choose to be money in the bank. Like if Ricochet wins, I want to see him actually be built up to be a dominant challenger for the champion to where I can actually believe, hey, maybe he has an actual shot instead of essentially jobbing out whoever wins the money in the bank for like three months until they actually cash it in. So I hope whoever wins the money in the bank get some sort of credibility and i don't want the exact same thing that happened with otis where they could have done something with otis otis had a lot of personality he had a lot of charisma i think if they would have booked him right and even with what they're doing with otis right now on smackdown if they had would have done something like that with him when he had the money in the bank instead of all this like law and order stuff that they did with Morrison, I think that it would have been a better story to tell. But that it just circles back to the main issue that I'm that we see on Raw and SmackDown is that yeah, you have these great champions and Roman Reigns and Bobby Lashley and whatnot. But the problem is that there really isn't anybody there to be that hot opposing challenger. So I do hope that they utilize the money in the bank to do something like that and also bring back some credibility to the actual money in the bank uh, stipulation. They need, to, they need to definitely do that. Denise, from your mouth to God's ears. Uh, I do have a follow-up for Brian, though, because we're talking about Brock Lesnar. And we all know Brock is the 
best businessman in the game when it comes to talent. And Brian, do you think that by waiting and Brock playing the waiting game and seeing them kind of have these, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to figure out what to do. He knows that SummerSlam is going to be a giant show. He knows that they need main events. Do you think that as of right now, Brock is just raising his price and once it hits a level where he's just like, okay, this is this is good enough that that we will see him because I feel like the longer this thing kind of goes, the better it is for Brock. Yeah, I mean, uh, I want to say one thing about what Denise said real quick, and that was that I think that she's right that you need something credible for Money in the Bank this year after this rigmarole that they did with Otis, and that's why my pick is actually like Drew McIntyre. Because if Drew McIntyre wins the Money in the Bank briefcase, he's cashing in and he's winning the title. And they're not going to do Law and Order, and they're not going to do comedy stuff, and they're not going to do anything like that. After this year with everything they did, I think that you've got to have a McIntyre or or some big star. I realize that everybody wants like uh, not big star to win Money in the Bank and then cash in and win the title and like get a big push, but like they haven't done that for years. And I don't think that this Vince McMahon is like, if he puts that thing on ricochet, we're going to get law and order again, <laughs> or he's just going to challenge for it and lose. So that's why I think Drew is going to get it. And then the thing with Brock is, so Dave and I had a, a, a fantasy booking idea, which is a little bit goofy, but at least it's different. And that is that the stipulation at Hell in a Cell was that if Drew loses, he can never challenge for the title as long as Lashley's champion. So if Lashley wins the money in the bank, he cannot cash in on Lashley. And they told that story last night, so that is the storyline. So you could do a story where Drew wins and he's got a year to cash it in, but at the same time, he has to wait for somebody to beat Lashley. Because if Lashley holds a title for an entire year, he has a briefcase that he could never cash in. It's something they've never done before. You can tell a story like, is Drew going to turn heel and screw Lashley out of the title so then he can challenge the winner or whatever? There's a lot of different ways you can go. But the other thing is, let's say that uh, it's uh, like uh, Lesnar, as you said. Let's say that Lesnar holds out for more money and uh, they decide that they're going to do him and Lashley at the SummerSlam show. So if they do that match and Lesnar wins, what are we doing? we would be going right back to Drew McIntyre and Brock Lesnar again. I would like to see somebody beat Lashley that then would be like a new match for Drew McIntyre. And then if you want to do something later on, you can do that. But it just feels like if Drew wins Money in the Bank and Lesnar wins SummerSlam, we're right back to the same thing that we've seen before. I think with, with Lesnar holding out for more money, if that's what he wants to do, I could imagine him wanting to hold out till WrestleMania but the difference is, this year's SummerSlam is going to be a WrestleMania caliber show. Like, they're running in a stadium. They're going to want a lot of fly-ins. They're going to totally pack this show. Like, they should be able to offer him the money for SummerSlam that he would make for a WrestleMania. I don't know what he's holding out for. Maybe in his mind, WrestleMania is more prestigious. Maybe he's going to say, like, you know, let them do Goldberg at SummerSlam and then I'll do WrestleMania or whatever. I don't know what he wants to do, but obviously... I mean, people always talk about Kevin Nash and guys like that. The smartest guy ever in terms of holding out for money is Brock Lesnar. And there's nobody close. And if he knows that they need somebody for SummerSlam, he's going to hold out for more money. And the key is he can keep holding out because he doesn't need the money. He just waits until they give him what he wants, and then he'll come back for a match. So I, I spoke to someone about this, about Lesnar. Uh, months ago, I was told that he was the main event pick for SummerSlam. Uh, it wasn't Cena at the time. It was going to be Lesnar. And they pivoted to Cena, but Les they want Lesnar for a live crowd. That I was told that from day one. Conversation started happening, and um, I, from what was alluded, it wasn't a financial issue. It was a, it was a uh, philosophy of storyline issue. So I don't know if they wanted him to lose. I don't, I, I don't know anything beyond that. This was told to me probably like three, four days ago uh, that they're still working on it. I, I'm 100%. I mean, don't get me wrong. Lesnar's showing up. Uh, I, don't, I don't know when. I don't, I don't know if it's going to be SummerSlam and we get something with Lashley and him, which 
Like Brian, you said it. I mean, that makes the most sense. How many years ago when Lashley showed up, that was part of the concept, right? Like you're going to get this first time match between those two guys. They're behemoths. I mean, they're just gigantic human beings that kind of fit each other in, in that in that big giant larger than life style match. Uh, I don't know if we're going to see that at SummerSlam. You know what? If we don't and we do happen to get a Bill Goldberg, like you said, I think people, whoever's going to Vegas, the 40,000 or 45,000, whatever that number is, most of those people are going to go home happy getting the, the, the chance to see a Bill Goldberg match. Forget about us. Forget about our community. Forget about our viewership. We know how they feel about it. But at the end of the day, those casual fans will leave happy. But when it comes to Lesnar, I, I mean, now we're going live TV, right? July, it's starting. In September, things start rolling a little bit differently. So now we're going to have Cena. We're going to have Lesnar. We're going to get Edge. Uh, there are rumors about the Edge match with uh, Rollins, possibly. That That's the big story now with this. Uh, they're going to be stacked. And the direction that I see them going is, is quite positive if you're stacking your roster this way. But now we need to get careful, right? Uh, Garrett, do you see them? Well, actually, what can I say one thing here yeah, real quick go before we go yeah. to Garrett? Yeah. Okay, so there is an, there's a really obvious, easy storyline here, which I don't even know because they never do them. But there's like a really obvious storyline. So if Brock Lesnar comes back, the last time we saw Brock Lesnar, he was with Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman is now with Roman Reigns. And Roman Reigns is this unbeatable, this unbeatable heel. And their idea, long term, obviously, is that Roman Reigns is going to go babyface and he's going to be the top babyface. So the it, something has to be done to do that thing, to turn him babyface, which I don't think, by the way, should be soon because I think there are a couple of big matches left for him, including if they can get him The Rock. And I know some people are going to hate this storyline because it involves Brock Lesnar winning the title, but the obvious storyline is Lesnar comes back and Lesnar is going to have a match with Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman is in Roman Reigns' corner. And the easiest way to turn Roman is during the match, Paul Heyman sides with his original client, Brock Lesnar, and they screw Roman Reigns and they take the title off of him. And that's your baby face turn for Roman Reigns. Now, I don't know how that's going to work with the fans, if they'll actually cheer Roman Reigns. Like, Paul Heyman's really smart, so he could probably come up with a scenario to maybe make it work. But that's an easy thing to do. I don't think that you should be rushing uh, a Roman reigns Lesnar storyline. Like, there's a really obvious storyline here that is a ways down the road. If you want to bring back Lesnar to face Lashley and do something there, you can do that. But at the same time, it's like if my long-term storyline is Lesnar versus Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman is involved and you don't know where Paul Heyman is going to go, I don't want to beat Brock Lesnar. I don't want to have Lesnar come back and lose to Bobby Lashley. So I'm not saying, I don't. I have no idea about negotiations with Lesnar, but if this is something involving like the storyline and, and however you described it, Andrew, I mean, these could be things that Lesnar and Paul Heyman are thinking about. Like this is a good long-term story and there's no reason to screw this up early by rushing back Brock Lesnar for a match with Lashley that he loses at SummerSlam. And SummerSlam is for sure too early to do Lesnar versus Roman Reigns if you've still got matches potentially with guys like John Cena and The Rock. That's uh, that's an awesome point. And it's something uh, on Wrestling Observer Radio, this is months and months and months ago, I asked Dave if he ever thought they would do the Brock and Roman with uh, with Paul Heyman kind of dangling their story. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, you can do anything. And my thought at that point was, well, when's the last time we've saw we've seen Brock Lesnar as a baby face, which has been like, I can't even remember the last time we saw him as a baby face. And I don't know if there's legs in him as a baby face, but ultimately, I think where you get is exactly what Brian said, which is if the goal is to turn Roman face, you utilize this story, this very personal story between Brock and Heyman and Roman and Heyman. And it, I think I think it's it's an awesome idea um, because my original thought was I would love to see Brock come in as a baby face and work with Roman, who is you know the biggest, craziest, bad heel going right now. Um, I, I don't think you can do that necessarily long term. I don't know if there's actual legs because Brock is kind of you know in and out so much. He he can't just be a, a long term baby face for them, but. I really, I really like that idea, and, and it does make a lot of sense as to why if Lesnar does hold out and, 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 you know, as far as, well, here's the direction, just like Andrew said, we're not sure this is the right direction for the, for the, the you know, long term, 
I, I think that I think that would be an awesome way to bring him back and to eventually get to Roman turning babyface. I think you know I. I... Lesnar's fascinating always. Uh, I always find the contract negotiation the most fascinating part of Brock Lesnar coming back uh, and the terms uh, and the dates. I always find that to be the most fascinating part. Uh, let's let's move on over to AEW. Uh, Garrett, uh, Kenny Omega, Jungle Boy. This is, uh, you know, I, I did not think I was as into this match, but the closer we've gotten into it, the more I'm getting hyped for it. Yeah, I kind of wanted to get everybody's, uh, I guess, booking idea as to what you all think that they should do here. There's been so much stop and start with the Jungle Boy that I, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know how many times they can beat him without hurting him. Um, this is an opportunity for him to be in the, the, his biggest match to date with Kenny Omega. And I don't know if they've booked themselves into a corner necessarily, but my worry here is that another loss uh, really, really doesn't isn't great for Jungle Boy. Um, we know Omega's not losing the strap, at least as far as I know. And in today's day and age, basically what AEW said was for, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, for world title matches, the time limit is 60 minutes. And even if the show, even if like, let, let's say there's 40 minutes left in the show and then it would go to the end, like the time limit doesn't stop. I think they said, we'll show it on YouTube if we ever go, you know, to get to that 60 minutes. So Interesting. Um, for, for, for Denise uh, and, and Brian and, and then you, uh, Andrew, I was kind of wondering what everybody thought as far as, you know, what, what do you think that they could do in this, in this match uh, where all parties, you know, still get something out of it, and uh, the I, I think the I think the biggest thing is to make sure that Jungle Boy isn't uh, isn't hurt by this match. You see, my thing here is that I'm looking at Kenny Omega, Jungle Boy, and obviously we all expect Kenny Omega to walk out as champion. I don't think any of us are expecting Jungle Boy to win. So, like, I I. I don't want, I would like a time limit. I think that would be something like that would be cool. But I would prefer, I don't mind seeing Jungle Boy get essentially pinned one, two, three in a clean finish because to me, just the fact that he's in this match with Kenny Omega, that's already saying like this guy, obviously him even being in like just, you know, him being in this match is already telling the people, telling the viewers, telling the fans like, hey, this guy is somebody to keep an eye out. And he might not necessarily be, you know, championship material or championship ready just yet but this is somebody you're gonna want to keep your eyes on so i personally think that regardless going into this match jungle boy is already a winner i think i, I mean i think that's i hope that you're right I, I hope that that is how the viewers are going to see it uh but brian i know you and dave have been talking about this do you have a do you have a, an idea that you think it would work for the finish of this match in your head as you, you know, just think about booking? Well, I mean, I, I uh, would not do a 60 minute draw on a Saturday night. Uh, that's just me on a live show. For first hour, but first what hour, I, the rampage hour. <laughs> you, I mean, you could, I, I honestly think that when they have big time world title matches on free TV, they should always start either at uh, the beginning of the first hour or the beginning of the second hour, because if this were real and you have a 60 minute time limit, like why would you start your world title match with 20 minutes left on the show? It doesn't even make any sense. So uh, I would start either at the beginning of the show or at the top of the second hour. But what I would do is I would have uh, Kenny Omega beat him clean with the one wing angel. But when I, when I watched the show last week, they did an angle in the back and uh, there's like an interview with Jungle Boy and Kenny Omega shows up in a golf cart with his buddies and they're being all wacky and Kenny Omega challenges him to a fist fight because he's so pretty and Jungle Boy's like, oh, yeah, this is dumb. So Kenny keeps challenging him and Jungle Boy's like, all right, well, let's do this. He starts taking his stuff off and then uh, Nakazawa attacks him and he gets a brief brawl with Omega. And then like Omega and Callus jump into the golf cart and the golf cart starts driving away and they shove Nakamura off the golf cart or Nakazawa and uh, he starts beating him up. And it was just like, it was so goofy. And uh, Dave was, you know, he was reviewing. He goes, I would not have done something like this. And I want to make it clear, I also would not have done anything like this. But what I 
what I got out of this is that this is not a pay-per-view match, okay? If this paper, if this was a pay-per-view on Saturday and that was your go-home angle, it's like you guys have lost your minds. Like, who in the world is buying the pay-per-view to see that match after this? But it's not. It's a television match. And so when I saw that they were doing, like, goofiness to lead to a television match, what I concluded was they don't want you to think that it's going to be a joke, but they want you to think that it's going to be just like they're going to do a match and Kenny Omega is going to win and it's just going to be something for television. But then what they are going to do is they're going to try to have like a match of the year candidate. I think that they're going to go in there and I think they're going to go like 35 minutes. And I think that Kenny Omega is going to give Jungle Boy everything. And they're going to do this match where you're not expecting it to be what it is because of the angle that they shot. But it is going to be that kind of match. And Jungle Boy is going to get near falls. And he's going to kick out of this. And the the Good Brothers are going to run in, and he's going to lay both of them out and send them packing. And they're going to give him this, and they're going to give him that, and they're going to give him this, and they're going to give him that. And finally, at the end, he's going to make one mistake and one winged angel, and Kenny Omega's going to do the cover where he's, like, dead. And then the match is over, and Kenny's not going to jump up. He's going to be laying there. He's going to be exhausted. And I, I feel that they can do the match that everyone always talks about where the guy lost, but he's over even bigger as a result of it. And I think that they can do that. I think that Kenny Omega can do that. I think the Jungle Boy can do that. I think that the angle they shot was designed for that, where when it's over, you're like, oh my God, like I thought it was going to be like just a, a match, but holy smokes, that was like a great match. And Jungle Boy looked awesome. He doesn't need to win yet. Like I, I know Dave is always talking about, oh, Jungle Boy needs this big win or whatever. He doesn't need it yet. It's not WWE. I don't feel that beating him in a fantastic world title match, I don't think your AEW fans are going to look at the guy when it's over and go, oh, what a loser. He just can't win the big one. I think they're going to look at it like he can't win the big one now. But, dude, this guy's going to win the big one. And I don't know when it's going to be, and I don't know who's it, who it's going to be, but I know that Jungle Boy can do this someday. That's what you want people to think about Jungle Boy right now. And I think that they've done such a good job with their booking over the last year that – you know, even that thing that they do with Darby Allen. Darby Allen challenges two guys to a handicap match, and even Sting is like, bro, this is a dumb idea. And he goes in there and he loses. And on paper, you look at it, it's like, well, that was a dumb idea. But if you watch the match, they did <laughs> really so much for Darby Allen that when it was over, it was like, I still feel that Darby Allen is a big deal. I still feel that he almost beat two guys all by himself. That's what they have taught their fans. If you're a WWE fan, you can look at it and think differently. But this isn't WWE. This is AEW. So that's what I think that they're going to do. And I really think that they're going to pull it off. You know, you, 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 the way you described how they should do that match got me really excited. And it actually brought up a, a distant memory I totally forgot about. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember uh, the Tajiri and, and uh, Triple H match that went on Raw. 2014, uh, 2004, 2003, whatever it was. And nobody believed Tajiri had a chance, but my God, close, uh, you know, two and a half, two and a half, closer to three, every pin, and people got behind it. And at the end of the day, you know what? Tajiri laid there dead, and Hunter killed him, but nobody looked at the match and said, my God, you know, this was, Tajiri got beat, you know, that's terrible for him. People were, people, it elevated him to some extent to some people. Same thing with Chris Jericho, when Chris Jericho beat him and then they did that title swerve. Uh, I think for Jungle Boy, he's, first of all, he's so young. Let me say one thing, Andrew. Yeah. If you liked those two, Kenny Omega will be way more oh, to the Jungle two. Boy than Triple H was to anybody. I love those two <laughs> matches, and it stands out, you know, because it, it it's resonated that, there was a possibility. Like, I don't think none of us are looking at this and saying Jungle Boy should win now or will win now. But you know what? If you could convince me that there's a possibility watching that this week, it's possible. I'll, I'll, I'll buy into it a little bit more. Also, do we know what the attendance might be for this show? Because that'll be a big part of the story, too. You know, with the crowd believing it and falling into it. Uh, I think that'll be a part of the story. I think it's really exciting. I think a guy I mean, like I, I will Boy, say one thing. I don't know what the attendance is, but if it were my company, 
I would have done the Jungle Boy Kenny Omega match on the first big show on Wednesday when they come back with a packed house. Oh, me too. I agree with you 100%. I, I, like, that's the crowd I would do this match in front of. Yeah, no, I agree with you because that that, that crowd is going to eat it alive. We saw, listen, we all saw what that crowd looked like when they had a packed crowd for that pay-per-view. Uh, the pops that, that Hangman Page got opening. I mean, everybody was so into it. And I think we're going to see that moving forward with a lot of these live events. And that kind of re- leads me to my last topic. I know, Brian, you got to get out of here soon. Uh, but, you know, with, it, with live attendance coming back in the next in, in a couple of weeks, you know, three weeks, uh, everything is rolling a little bit differently. How do you see the attendance standing? Uh, will we uh, right now? I mean, we, we know the ticket sale issues that they're both facing in some markets. Uh, we have a big show for AEW here in Queens, New York. Where am I? Queen Seven Line shirt here. Uh, very proud that they're going to be six minutes away from my house, so it's going to be a very easy trip for me to go to uh, Arthur Ashe Stadium. So uh, obviously, a big market like that, I'm not concerned about ticket sales. Seventeen thousand, sixteen thousand, whatever it is, they'll get that. But some of these smaller markets, Brian, I'm going to go to you first. I know you got to get out of here. Uh, how do you think both WWE and AEW will do with ticket sales, and also? Companies like Ring of Honor and Impact, what, what's, where do you think they're going to fall moving forward to 2022? Well, what I think is that at the beginning, we're going to see kind of what we're seeing right now, which is like a SummerSlam in a stadium is going to do very well, but your average super show is not going to do so well. And I do believe that unless like WWE booking totally tanks, I think that come September, October, November, and certainly in uh, 2022, I think that we're going to see everything really increase. And my my thought on attendance of late, uh, outside of like big shows, is we are just now coming out of this pandemic. And, you know, some people were more concerned about it than others. But, uh, you know, I've got both of my shots, I'm fully vaccinated, and I'm not all that concerned about going out into a crowd because I'm vaccinated. With that said, because of the last year plus, when I go places now and there is a big crowd, there's still that feeling like, dude, there's a, there are people crawling all over the place here. This is weird. And, you know, I'm gonna go to uh, All Out in Chicago, but, it's still like if there was a big WWE event with a ton of fans that was taking place this coming Sunday near where I am right now, I'm not quite sure I would go right now. Um, and I think there's a lot of people like that, that even if they're vaccinated, there's just, it's been so long that that we've kind of been conditioned to not go in crowds that there's there's still, I think, a weirdness for a lot of people. I think that that's going to dissipate. And I think that that when fans watch shows, and I'll just put it this way, before that last AEW pay-per-view, or the last show that they had, the, the pay-per-view, where Hangman is there, and the, the place was just going crazy for that Brian Cage match. I mean, I was, I was still like, and I'm probably going to go to Chicago, but it still feels a little bit early for me. Man, I saw those fans there, and I was like, I'm going to Chicago, dude. And I think that once AEW opens up to fans, and WWE opens up to fans, and fans are watching on TV, and they see all these people here, and these people are having so much fun, and it's so exciting. I think that the people that are right now hesitant to buy tickets, I think they're going to be like, I'm going to buy a ticket. This looks awesome. And I think that as time goes by, I think that that's going to increase. Now, I would say that for sure, I think August, September, November, we're going to see like packed crowds. But I also feel that there's still a lot of people in this country that are not vaccinated. And I think that come September and October, I think that you're going to see a rise in COVID cases among the people that are not vaccinated. And I think that the media is going to go crazy about this because we're going to see like the start of this this wave. And I think people are going to be a little worried again. And I think there's going to take a while for that to dissipate. But I, I think that probably come... You know, I think WrestleMania next year is going to be like 80,000 people in that building. I think that uh, next year's uh, Double or Nothing, I think it's going to be packed. And I think that everything from then on out, we're going to see like tons of people. Wrestling is going to look really fun again. And I think more and more people are going to start buying tickets. I think it's going to be like up and down right now for the time being. You know, some people are really excited. Some people are hesitant. 
some of those hesitant people are going to get excited and then the fall is going to come and they're going to be like, eh, not so sure about that. And I think it's going to start to go up again come next spring. So that's my thought on ticket sales. I think any ticket sales numbers right now that people are freaking out about, I don't think you should freak out about it. We're, we're still in a, in a period that I think is an aberration. And I think that as long as things don't collapse in booking for AEW and more so in WWE, because they've already kind of collapsed, I think that things are going to really start to turn around. But I think it's going to be in 2022. So Denise, you're you're also I, I along. Listen, I'm going to I'm going to Chicago. I, I all that's going. all set. We're all going to Chicago. Uh, I'm gonna. You guys are gonna get a little taste of how nuts I am in real life. Uh, <laughs> I, I I'm just preparing you. I'm just letting you guys know. I'm very well behaved on the air. I go I go crazy in real life. Uh, but Denise, you're also coming to SummerSlam, which I'm gonna be there also. How do you feel about the travel? Okay, so I was at AEW Double or Nothing, and I'll just say it. Coming from California, that is a very different from Florida. When I was down in Florida, I thought, oh, my God, I'm cheating on California and all my Californian values because I was out there, you know, obviously I'm vaccinated and all of that, but it still felt very strange to be there with all of these hundreds of people without a mask and, you know, people were coming up to me, and it was just, like, so, like, weird. But then here's the thing, though, is that – I kid you not, here in Southern California, I have been struggling to get tickets to go to the zoo, to go to Knott's Berry Farm, to go to these theme parks. I was at a theme park and it was completely packed and people here at least are ready to go out there and are going out there because we were on a reservation system. And so people were just ready to go. And I'll tell you, driving around these streets, every single restaurant has lines outside. There are are tons of people going everywhere so for me it was a little bit surprising to see that maybe some people are still a little bit nervous about going out there and obviously you know I don't blame them I just think it's different like you know once you have your vaccine and once you kind of get like that first moment where you're like back out there again and you're thinking okay I can do this I'm slowly settling in so we'll see what happens you know I, I like both of the, of the points and you know Brian mentioned basically what we call FOMO, fear of missing out, right? I think there's there's going to be a lot of that. And I felt the same way watching watching that show that Denise was, was just at. Um, the, the way that I look at this, I always like to look to like real sports and how they're doing things and how the attendance is there. Uh, so in the Bay Area, starting this weekend, the San Francisco Giants are opening up their stadium I went to a game uh, last Monday, and it was it was still socially distanced. They had a vaccination section, which is where I was sitting, but there was you know maybe nine thousand people. And this weekend, there's probably going to be forty, forty one thousand, forty two thousand people in that ballpark. And the thing that I think people need to realize is WWE tickets before the pandemic were a little soft on the shows that, that Brian mentioned, like the super show and your normal shows and the big shows, the big shows are going to draw because you have reasons for, for people to go. Uh, but I do think that it's going to take a little while for some of those shows to, um, to be hot. And, and I think AEW is a little bit more of a mystery because they only had a certain amount of time frame to actually get their thing going. And so they're a little bit more of a mystery to me as far as how they're going to do weekly uh but i i, I do I, I would look to major league baseball um the nba is in the playoffs and, and so there's you know that that's a little bit of a different story that's like you know basically a pay-per-view every every game or whatever but you know look look to real sports and see how the the fan bases are coming back to those parks now baseball's a little different because it's outdoors and i think people are, are much more comfortable with that but you know that that is kind of if those sports are hot and those fans are coming back hot and WWE is a little bit cold and, and maybe there's a little bit less uh, of that. Um, I would hope, like Brian said, when we get to these moments where SummerSlam becomes a WrestleMania, that does create more interest and that creates uh, some. And, and look, WWE has to do the work, too. They have to create things that people want to go see. Uh, like, like, you know, we're talking about how this Raw show was you know pretty entertaining, though we may not really believe that they're going to go anywhere with some of these folks. I would not have gone to that if that was in my neighborhood um, to, to one, because it's a long show. Uh, I, I haven't been a fan of live three hour raws, 
But also, they're, like, I would rather go to the baseball game instead. Like, if I had the opportunity, I'm going to the Giants game rather than going to an indoor WWE event. But when it comes to WrestleMania, I'll be there. When it comes to, um, you know, other shows down the line that, that they make important and they make you feel like you're going to miss something if you are not there, those are the ones that I'm going to go to. So it is also up to them and it is up to the product to make you want to go to these shows when there may be some people who are a little apprehensive right now. I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, so this was our first show. I think we lost Brian. I think Brian had to duck out. Yeah, Brian. Oh, I'm no, here. Brian. Oh my God. I thought yes. Brian left. I, I was wanted to, to thank say you. goodbye. All right. I wanted to thank you, Brian, for, uh, for coming on. Of course, having us on and doing the show. Yeah, I want to thank you guys for uh, for doing the show. I mean, uh, I'll come back on next time when it's actually live, so I can uh, yes. properly uh, plug it on server live here. Yeah, next but, time uh, we're live, I do want to thank you guys for having me on for the first show. Listen, it's been a wild couple of weeks for me, uh, and and this just elevates it even more to do this with the, with a with an unbelievable panel here. Obviously, everybody knows Denise. I get messages daily from people saying, "Where's Denise?" And now it's become a part of our show where we look at each other randomly at random topics on the show. And we go, where's Denise? So we need to start selling those shirts. I think that needs to go up with a where's Denise shirt. Uh, of course, Garrett and, and Brian, I want to thank you guys, uh, of course. Uh, we'll be back next week, next Tuesday. We're going to be live. We'll be uh -oh. live next week. So, promising. Uh, it very promising. If I could get my my act together, we could go live. This was all on me. Every we were good to go live. It was not, it was my fault. I just wasn't prepared. Uh, so next week we'll be live. Obviously, everything that we do, you can find us on F4W online on the Wrestling Observer website. Uh, Denise does a show, bunch of shows. Denise, you do a lot of stuff. I You're cover everywhere. NXT, AEW, Dynamite, and Friday Night SmackDown. I have the Twitch commercials. I mean, you'll pretty much just see me everywhere. And I promote everything on Twitter and all of that. So you'll definitely see every all of that. And Garrett, uh, you obviously do Wrestling Observer Wrestling Radio Observer. on the weekends. <laughs> And, uh, and of course, you, you have your, your, your other shows that you're doing, which are unbelievably great also. Yeah, Fight Game Podcast is on Wednesday evening. Though, you know, Wrestling Observer Radio with Brian and Dave is, is such a stalwart. We take a little bit of a backseat to that show, but we'll be up. You know, we're usually up Thursday morning. Uh, yeah, so, you know, myself and my, my partner, John LaRocca, and like in Fridays, I usually do Wrestling Observer Radio with Dave. And the reason why I do that show is literally to give Brian a break. Like Brian needs to <laughs> also have a life. And so I try to push <laughs> in so that he can have at least one night maybe where, uh, where he's not waiting for, for Dave at one o'clock in the morning. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, you can, you can find us fight game media network also is, is our Patreon. If you guys want to check that out. Very cool stuff. By the way, uh, I, I, I want this to get back to Dave. So I had emailed Dave sometime in 2002 asking for him to do a compilation of The Observer and if it was ever possible to get it in book form. And I never heard back from him. But this was most likely, yeah, it was 2002. So the invasion had happened, everything had happened. And I have to tell you, these books, I'm, I'm given this was not a set plug, but I'm going to give it anyway. This thing, I absolutely love the fact that I could get an entire year's worth in one shot and go down memory lane. Uh, obviously you could get it on, uh, on Amazon right now, but I, I do, I know between you, uh, Garrett and, and Brian, I, I want you to, I want you to let them know. I emailed them 20 years ago <laughs> asking for this. And I'm glad that it took 20 years. Uh, it's finally, here. it took 20 years, but I finally have it now. My compilation of the observers. So now it, I'm going to have it this... still the same Juno. email. It was a Juno email. Yep. It was a Juno yes. email. hundred percent. Uh, so I it's probably still in that inbox somewhere, that Juno inbox, <laughs> if anybody has access. Uh, but I, I definitely, uh, this has been a, this has been a great ride the last couple months, uh, especially for my podcast and of course joining, uh, joining you guys. So we'll be doing this every single week. Uh, with that said, we'll see you next time. Take care.